Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight um, uh, on our Dawn Patrol uh, podcast or video cast. I don't even know what, what I would call this at this point. It's more of a everything I like to talk about. <laughs> Um, and if you want to listen, you listen. Um, I have a professor at Emeritus, uh, Phil Saban, uh, who, if you are, if you have traipsed into the world of professional wargaming and or attended King's College in London, you probably are aware of who he is. Um, uh, it's an honor, first of all, Phil. Um, uh, let me just give you the floor a little bit and tell us just... Uh, where are you at, right? Where are you at now? Uh, have you, uh, obviously, as an Emirates, then um, you are retired fully from King's College? Yes, I retired just before COVID, in hindsight, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with um, uh, a very good timing, because I didn't need to put all my courses rapidly online, as all my colleagues did, uh, right. as a result of uh, as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, but uh, uh, I retired uh, mainly because uh, I, I needed for uh, domestic reasons to uh, move to the other side of the world. Um, and uh, uh, also because I wanted more time to uh, do the games that I wanted to, uh, to, to play and design. Um, so uh, since retiring in uh, at the end of 2019, uh, my output of games has increased significantly in terms of uh, uh, all the way from ancient warfare right up to uh, jet age air power interesting okay um i i i gather from your from your books and from your uh papers and and, and uh, so forth that uh you know ancient um ancient war gaming or classical war gaming is probably your strongest uh pat would you say that during um when did you get into war gaming and was it uh before you got into history or as a result of, of taking part in his history programs? Like many people of my generation, uh, I was inspired by uh, collecting airfix figures as a child, and then some of the early wargaming books, in my case, uh, uh, Charles Grant's Battle Practical Wargaming, when I was 12 years old. Uh, and so I started using uh, the, uh, the airfix kits and airfix figures uh, from all periods. Um, with the the rules that were being published then in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, and uh, it, it really went from there. Um, my uh, academic interest in uh, in history uh, was on a, a parallel track, if you like, and what I was able to do during my career was to bring the two together. So uh, for the last oh uh, 30 years or so. Uh, I've been introducing games into my teaching of military and civilian students on strategy and, and whatever. Um, and then uh, uh, I uh, uh, wrote my book, Lost Battles, published in 2007, which applied wargaming as a methodology to try to understand ancient warfare. Uh, uh, and at the same time, started an MA course where I actually taught students how to design simple simulations of their own. Uh, so really, my story is of a hobby interest in wargaming and a scholarly interest in uh, strategy and, uh, and military history coming together to form uh, this uh, this synergy. Very interesting. Um, was there a formal uh, wargaming department or even subsection of the history? Of the history uh, department at King's College. In other words, like how did in, in your from your vantage point, you know, when did in, in academia, when did wargaming become not not popular, but but became a, a, a substantive part of curriculum? Uh, as I've written uh, a number of times, there's a significant stigma to wargaming in uh, academia. Um, most scholars know nothing about wargaming and uh, uh, and are prejudiced against it if they uh, if they do come across it. Now that's changed somewhat recently, uh, particularly in the fields of international relations, strategic studies. Uh, uh, there's been more openness to including wargaming as a teaching aid uh, and even as a research tool. Military history, I have to say, remains a very difficult area. Uh, because historians, unless they happen to be wargamers themselves, 
uh, do tend to dislike the idea of war games just as they dislike counterfactual speculation about what might have been in the past. Um, even there, things are gradually changing. Charles Esdale, for example, uh, a very uh, famous and uh, uh, expert historian of the Napoleonic Wars, and coincidentally also a war gamer, has just literally now, uh, uh, last week, um, published a book with the U.S. Marine Corps uh, University Press called Wargaming Waterloo. Um, so I'm not the only uh, military historian uh, who's actually writing about wargaming as something that's worth taking uh, into consideration. Uh, you just brought this idea into my head. Do you feel do you feel that the kind of um, the rise of board gaming? as a frontline main more of a mainstream offering like in the united states i don't know if in the uk uh, or chile they have at, at this point we have gaming cafes you know you know what i mean like sure. it's becoming now very popular to game in general yeah. so i yeah. feel like that's definitely going hand in hand and, and then now you have people who are probably thinking like, like if you even if you're even if your professor is not necessarily thinking about gaming a situation, then the students are bringing that, you know, that more uh, Euro game approach to, to or whatever style of games, card games and so forth. So it's, I feel sure. like we're at that precipice of war gaming. If you, um, yeah, I, I, we shouldn't exaggerate, of course. Uh, there were far more war gamers in the 70s than there uh, are yeah. now. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, very much a niche uh, hobby. As you say, um, in broader areas, video gaming, of course, since the 90s, 80s and 90s, uh, and then uh, Euro games and the, uh, the rise of games in general uh, have made uh, gaming respectable. Um, uh, war games, of course, are, r remain only a very small and little known subset of that. Uh, so we shouldn't think that we're in a golden age of war gaming now, certainly right. not in terms of numbers. Maybe uh, a we do. But we, we do benefit. We do benefit from the uh, the much greater awareness, not only of computer games, but also now of manual games through the spread of the uh, of the Euro gaming hobby. Yeah, I've even I, I, I even see it in the workplace now. Now now there are gaming groups at work locations, and I've even seen I've even seen managers and individuals calling out individuals who are positively teaching other people games, which is sure. quite, in, quite. it's just amazing to kind of finally see that. It's almost like, hey, I've been doing this for decades, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the rise of professional gaming and professional war gaming, yeah. uh, by which I don't mean that you're a professional poker player or whatever, that, that, that you're using this tool, you're using this mechanism uh, as a means to an end within your professional career. Um, that's uh, uh, very hopeful, I think, and uh, that's being done more now, certainly bottom up uh, than uh, it ever was before. Previously, there were top down uh, uh, initiatives to use uh, right. wargaming for training purposes and right. for uh, uh, operational analysis. Now you're getting gamers within, for example, the military, including many of my former students uh, who are producing initiatives, UK Fight Club or International Fight Club is, is a wonderful example of this. Um, and they're, they're, they're using their hobby experience and saying this can actually benefit us professionally. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's taking off. So, um, was there, uh, so what is, uh, now that you've mentioned uh, the UK Fight Club, how, um, like, what is your connect, what is your connection to the UK Fight Club? And how did you get involved in potentially producing take that hill in particular um one of my former students uh, uh now major ed farron uh, uh in, in the uh, british army wanted to use the skills that uh, he'd learned from his hobby and from uh, the, uh, the the course that i've uh, been running since 2003 and so he was one of the uh, the, the major uh, players behind the uh, uh, evolution of UK Fight Club. There are others, including some of my former students, who are, are playing an equally important role. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so that's an example of uh, the educational initiatives that I took uh, bearing fruit. Um, Take That Hill uh, uh, arose as, as very much a means to an end when we were uh, invited to 
run a day of wargaming uh, for a, a brigade command team in Britain. Uh, and I needed something that was even simpler than the games in my book, Simulating War, because we didn't have time. You know, we had about 10 minutes to be able to play right. something. Uh, and so I designed Take That Hill for that. Um, it worked uh, pretty well, more by uh, uh, luck than judgment in terms of uh, uh, my inexperience with <laughs> running things uh, without uh, uh, preparation uh, of particularly the commanding officer whom I uh, asked to take command at the, the last minute without asking him beforehand. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thankfully he won. Um, and uh, so the game was there. I didn't think any more of it. I, mean, I, I publicized it, obviously. Uh, it, it made it available through the uh, website of the Connections UK Wargaming Conference. Um, and it was Ed Farron who really took that on, along with a number of my other designs, expanded it, developed it, added uh, optional rules and more details and so on, made it even more explicitly a modern rather than World War II uh, uh, situation. Um, uh, and that was how Take That Hill in its UK Fight Club incarnation, the boxed game, this, uh, this wonderful box game yeah. that, uh, that they've produced. Yeah. Uh, came about. So it was a, a combination of my alumni uh, with something I'd developed for a very specific purpose, but which has now become uh, used far more widely. So so it's it, it's probably a good thing that you were um, under the gun, if you will, or uh, under the clock to, to produce it because it, because I think it really, it really cuts down to the nitty gritty of what you need to, it's a great I would classify it as a great uh, gateway game, if you will, right? <laughs> like it's just sure. enough. It's just enough of the mechanics so that somebody who does not war game um, can very easily play it. It's 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 probably even I would say you know uh, slightly easier or more approachable than like a Catan or any other type of Euro game. So sure. I, I can easily see just about anybody playing it and enjoying it. First of all, um, yeah. Uh, in in my book, uh, I argue against the tendency which uh, has existed really since the 1970s for war games uh, to become more and more complex, more and more detailed, 20 pages, 30 pages of rules and so on. Um, uh, and losing sight of the fact that for most people, games are things that have the rules posted in the, in the inside of the box lid, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and even then, they, 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 they're not too keen on, on reading them. They just want to get on and, and, and play it. Um, so I've tried to reduce uh, my, my systems to the bare essentials, just a few pieces, uh, just a page of rules initially, um, uh, which uh, uh, non-gamers uh, could then uh, get into. It didn't take too long to be able to explain it to them and for them then to be able to, uh, to, 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 to play this game. I've used similar sorts of ideas uh, with a number of other um, systems for, in all uh, eras, all the way from ancient times to the present, um, on the basis that if you make a game simple enough, you can spend, let's say, the first 20 or 30 minutes of a class explaining to people how to play it, a class even of 30, 50 people, and then as long as, long as you've got enough copies, they can play one another. You don't need to just run one game that you're babysitting all the time. If you make the rules simple enough, then you can actually run it for large uh, uh, large groups. Take that hill is of, of that order of complexity, uh, although in this case it was designed as a, as a solitaire game rather than a competitive game, uh, but it can be played either way. I just wanted to just do a quick share of uh, what it looks like just so people have a little bit better idea how it's looking. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I was going to show you, I was going to show your night, your night fighter solitaire rules, which I only just, I only just ran into, by the way. Uh, uh -huh. oh, bugger, where are you? I think I'm going to just mess up. Hold on, give me one second. Uh, here we go. All right, so this is the, uh, the war game, Take That Hill, that we've been talking about. Um, I'm just going to go real kind of quickly just just kind of give people an idea what what the components are and so forth um sure. so the uh forces are depicted as pretty much just uh pretty much elements uh, of uh fire teams uh combined into platoons and i and i think at most you would probably recommend this to be played at company or or, or smaller organization correct that's what you well 
Take that hill is a platoon attacking a hill defended by a, a, a machine gun section. Um, right. It's it's a distillation of a system which is uh, in my book, which can be used for um, a, a battalion attack um, with uh, w with several companies. Um, but that, of course, has more pieces and takes longer. Uh, the point of take that hill is it distills it down to the lowest mm -hmm. reasonable level with so just you... three with just three pieces that, that you're in control of, one right. uh, per section, against one enemy piece. You can't get much much simpler than that. Right, right. So you're, so you're saying it, it, it definitely directly derived from, was it from the tactical or from the de uh, or from the World War II? Uh, uh, the, 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 the original game uh, uh, was fire and movement. Ah, that's what um, okay. Okay, um, th that, 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 that spawned several things. Yeah. Um, one was take that hill, so at, at, at platoon level rather than uh, company and battalion level. One was blockbusting, that's included uh, in my book, um, and uh, uh, that is a company level assault within uh, a, 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 a city such as uh, Stalingrad or whatever, um, uh, showing the particular mechanics of street fighting. Um, and then uh, you, you just showed it quickly there. Since um, uh, retiring, uh, I've produced Combined Arms, which is, if you like, the next evolution of fire and movement uh, in the sense that uh, the uh, defenses are automated, so it can be played solitaire, as can take that hill. In fact, it's, it's, it's designed expressly for solitaire play. Um, I, I, I take advantage of that uh, so that the uh, opponents, you never know how many there are or where they are because solitaire systems can keep secrets and uh, uh, the uh, defenders appear randomly. Um, and, as you, uh, and as you can see from the title there, uh, it includes armor and anti-tank guns, which were not part yeah, of the Yeah, so, so it's a little bit, there's a little yeah. bit more to it. It's a great game, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, I, <laughs> I described it to somebody as Catan with MMGs. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> if if only in terms of the amount of people who play Catan, Catan is one of the most <laughs> well, successful well, games of modern times. We, well, primarily because of the hex of hexes, right? You know, because sure. I love this system. By the way, I haven't mm -hmm. I haven't had a chance to play it. Um, I've, I've kind of played it myself a little bit, but but I, I haven't sure. had a chance to play it. I, mm -hmm. I did make um, I did make a tabletop simulator module for it with uh, Russo-Ukrainian war uh, models. So I'll show you that at some point. Uh, I mm -hmm. think I sent you a picture of that. Um, yes, you did. Uh, it's a great game. Um, it, what I like is I, I definitely liked the fact that I'm assuming you had originally designed it from solo up. I, I, you're, you're one of the you're one of the rare war, uh, war game designers that that takes solo into account. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about like throughout your own wargaming uh, past, right? Uh, did you uh, do you enjoy solo wargaming, and, and how do you how do you see um, the appreciation and the attendance of solo wargaming as, as a powerful mechanism for training purposes? Okay, um, most hobby games are played solo. Whether or not they're designed to be played solo, <laughs> most, are, most are played solo for, I think, two reasons. One is that many people don't have nearby opponents. Um, uh, and even with the internet, many people actually prefer to game solo because these games take so long uh, and they cry out for tweaks and so on. And it's easier to get yourself to accept that and to, to devote the time to it than it is to get an opponent to agree with you. Um, so for all sorts of reasons, I think solo has always been dominant. Um, designers have, uh, uh, I think, especially recently, uh, come on board with that and designed uh, solo systems, basically artificial intelligence, uh, manual rather than computer-based artificial intelligence. That's the secret to uh, a truly solitaire design. Uh, and what you're doing is automating uh, the, the other side so that you don't have to do what most uh, 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 solo gamers do when they come to a normal game, which is to schizophrenically swap hats and play one side and then swap and play the other uh, uh, the, and, uh, uh, and be both sides alternately. Yeah. The grand, um, the grand, 
the irony of that, though, is that if you look at the planning processes of the uh, the U.S. Army, USMC, you in effect during your planning process during the what they call the um, the um, you know, the IPV, right, the planning of the battlefield and so forth. You're, yep. You are schizophrenically trying to figure out the 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 Red Forces uh, COAs or courses of action. So it's interesting. It's interesting how how planning how professional planning mirrors how we've played war games for, for decades as well. So uh, absolutely, and uh, of course, in professional contexts. Uh, there usually are opponents available. You don't have the same um, uh, features which make uh, uh, solitaire play uh, so prominent in the hobby world uh, 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 apparent. Um, I still think that solo games have something to contribute um, because uh, in the professional context, uh, rather in the same way as you can play a uh, video game um, against the AI. Uh, and you learn quite a lot solving the puzzle, if you like, of how to beat the AI. Most most video games that are not online multiplayer uh, uh, games uh, are essentially solving, cracking a puzzle. Now, in cracking that puzzle, you learn what the techniques are to be able to defeat that opponent. Yeah? You, are, you can apply that same principle in Take That Hill. You can try over and over again to beat the system, mm -hmm. and eventually you will do so. Uh, there's luck in it, so you'll never be absolutely certain of winning, but your, your, your odds will certainly improve as your tactics improve. Um, and people are, through that process, learning the tactics of overcoming uh, an opponent through using fire and movement type mechanics, which is the central thread there. What you get with um, uh, two-player games, of course, is outguessing the opponent so that the opponent won't always do the same thing. In a computer game, once you know the route to solving it, you, 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 you've, you've solved it. You don't need to play it again. You've won. Um, uh, in a, in a two-player or team-based war game, um, just because you win this time doesn't mean to say you'll win next time because the opponent will do something else, do you see? So I think both have enormous value. Uh, uh, you don't... Uh, 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 it's not that only one is legitimate uh, and the other is uh, is useless. Both have a contribution to make. Very good. Um, I did want to take a blast through the past here and take a look at just kind of how how you got to where you. I want to show people what you've uh, the, the plethora, if you will, of games that you've worked on. And there's so many in here that I want to try out. By the way, now I, every time I talk to some, every time I talk to a war game designer, I go look at what they've done, and I'm, and and I realize I have I have months of gaming to do apparently. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go back in time here a bit. Uh, there's of course Lost Battles, but let's go way back, right? Uh, so in '93, you had worked on uh, Phalanx. Um, yep. And describe this time period. What uh, was this more of a um, the hobbyists? Just you know the the the, the immortal hobbyist who 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 just wants to print what you know who wants to print their war game to play at their wargaming club. Like is that is that how this came to be? Is is more of a I want to get I want to have my my game published so we have a nice copy at the wargaming club, or or was it uh, or was there a different intent at this time? In this time? Uh, there's a great deal of continuity here, and you're showing their um, Phalanx, Legion, Stratagos, and then it goes on to Lost Battles. These are all evolutions uh, of my attempts, which I've been doing since since I was a child, um, to model ancient battle. Uh, in fact, the scenarios are effectively the same battles throughout those different systems, just modeled in different ways as my ideas evolved. Phalanx, for example, uh, is my attempt to uh, have a more... Um, a, a, a less um, um, what's the word um, a more precise version of a system called DBA um, yeah. which was which yeah. was Phil Barker's game uh, yeah. and uh, uh, you know each unit has each side has 12 elements uh, different kinds and they meet up and the one thing I didn't like about that system 
uh, is that it's an ungridded miniatures game, and I don't like ungridded miniatures games because you're always uh, uh, uncertain of, of whether your your uh, you, you know your unit can move quite that far or what the matchup is of one yeah. or the other, and so on. You okay. see, so yeah. it's basically DBA converted to hexes with my take also in terms of mechanics, uh, and, and the rest. You, I was going to ask you if you preferred ha hex and count. You have a pretty equal background, though, in miniatures wargaming as well, correct, or, or no? I, I do, and, uh, you know, uh, early on I was playing um, wargames of search group rules and then a bit of DBA and DBM, but uh, over time, especially, uh, I, I became disenchanted with the the, uh, the problems of using tape measures and, uh, and, and the, the juxtaposition of units, you see. Um, right. So very soon I, 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 I tried to integrate that with hexes because i was board gaming as well so i could see the advantages of both right, um right. Uh, and phalanx uh, uh is on a, a i think an 11 by um seven uh, or 11 by nine hex grid uh legion then is a more detailed version it's like dbm to uh, to dba it's on a 21 by 17 hex grid in lost battles uh i i had a much simpler grid um because i realized that miniatures gamers didn't want to make their hexes. Uh, they, they didn't want to have, to have to make a hex board in order to play my, uh, my game. So Legion, for example, mm -hmm. wasn't played anything like as much as Lost Battles for the simple reason that it needed a hex board. Lost Battles has a five by four square grid uh, and, you know, any normal table, you just put a few rocks on it and to, you show the, uh, the corners and you can play Lost Battles, you see. So there's an example of trying to find a way that grids can be used, but they're not so obtrusive that miniatures gamers uh, are turned off. So did, it's constantly did, been trying to get the best of both worlds in this regard. I did see, I did see almost the equivalent of a sand table play of Lost Bells, which I thought was quite, mm -hmm. quite nice eh? because you really showed that hey, wargaming. We've done that since since we were kids, right? You know, yep. just toy soldiers and or, you know, bottle caps even I've used, right? Yep. Um, so this is interesting. And I didn't know that, again, these are things I got to go find now, of course. Um, do they still produce the Lost Battle? Or do do any of these box sets still exist by any chance? Because these look beautiful. They, they oh. are. Um, uh, they, they, they were a real bugger to produce. Uh, they cost the earth. Um, they cost ridiculous yeah. amounts of money to ship because they were too heavy. Um, and uh, the short answer is, uh, no, it's not in print. It hasn't been in print since about 2012. Um, however, uh, one can find... How much would it cost box, uh, A couple, two or three hundred dollars. Um, one can find yeah, right. um, uh, used sets online if you're willing to pay the price, and particularly you're willing to pay the shipping. Uh, you, you know, you can you can get them uh, if you're patient. It looks really um, good. But, it, it looks like uh, no, it's it's, it it's, like it's great. Yeah. Uh, um, sure, but, but what 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 it does show is um, the the problems of trying to produce a deluxe uh, board game. Uh, it, it, it even included the book because I wanted people to have the the paperback book oh, so that they got all the historical good. notes for reference. That that's one reason it weighed so much. Um, so so uh, uh, it's it's, it's it's not it's not been reprinted um, uh, and it's unlikely to be. However, Lost Battles the book the original book is still available yeah. as an ebook. And uh, on the Board Game Geek site uh, and uh, the uh, IO group for the uh, for, for Lost Battles, uh, I've put the relatively simple uh, expansion rules, uh, which allow you to play with the latest Lost Battles rules from the board game using only the book, which is still available. You see? Mm, very good. Um, yeah, with, very good. with Legion, with Legion, it's an interesting story. I've come back to Legion recently and actually produced a, a simpler version, Legion 2, capitalizing on the fact that Legion is still available. You can still get Legion in the 2015 edition that's uh, shown there from the okay. Society of Ancients because it's very simple to print. It's just cut out and, uh, and, and, uh, and mount That's counters. Nice. That's good. Um, so you can yeah. still get that. Uh, and with my free add-on, you can you, you, you can play that, you see. Uh, but the, the, what, what, one problem that always exists in, in gaming in general is games go out of print 
um, and uh, it's all very well producing a modification for it or tweaks for it or whatever. If nobody's got it anymore, they can't use it. You see. Um, speaking of speaking of printing, uh, I hate to, to to go back up here, but um, take that hill. Obviously, you showed that really beautiful uh, box set. Is yep. that is that ever going to be potentially available in, in like a U.S. distributor by any chance? Like, obviously, somebody would pay for it, but uh, okay. is that ever is that ever considered? to be distributable to even armed service fight clubs and and you know for a cost of course. what what i understand from ed farron and this is very much uh, um ed farron and his colleagues who uh, who produced this um uh, they got the funding to produce a thousand of these be beautiful box sets um uh, but these were for professional use they were to be yeah. given away within the british army and uh, 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 other armies uh, to encourage people to actually have something uh, tangible uh, 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 and to play wargaming. Those have now uh, all been uh, given out. The, the funds sure. that were provided to do that as a, as a freebie have, 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 have been uh, expended. Um, uh, and if they do produce another uh, print run of it, and they're hoping to do so, um, that will be on a more commercial basis. So people will then need to buy it now. Um, whether that means it will get into hobby stores uh, is another question. It will, I uh, hope, be available online. Uh, the whole right. issue of you know getting into the distribution network uh, of uh, of hobby games and games in general is is another question. Uh, but right. if they do produce another uh, hard copy version, my understanding it will, it will be it. on a more be commercial be. basis, so that you know militaries as well as uh, as individual uh, users. Uh, will be able to get it as long as they're prepared to pay a little. Very good. That sounds great. Um, mm -hmm. So bring me up through history here. We, we've gotten through, obvi obviously, your early ancient work, classical work. Um, you, do st you do start to step your foot into World War II. Uh, was there a particular... Was it for purely from, you know, your own, your own likes and, and, and the background of historical likings? Or was there a particular reason why you ended up going towards World War II? Is it because you kind of wanted it? Is it because you were starting to be asked to, to produce things from a fire and movement perspective? Or No. Yeah. Um, like, like most war gamers, right. uh, I'm very Catholic in my taste with regard to period. Uh, you know, you, you, you will find few people who only play ancient war games or only play World War II war games. They, they play across all periods, Napoleonic, Seven Years' War, you name it, you see. Um, uh, so I've long had this interest across the field of military uh, history in terms of gaming. Um, my interests in terms of academics uh, uh, military history uh, are more in terms of analysis of conflict dynamics than a narrow specialism on a particular period. So I was using the same kind of strategic and tactical uh, uh, analytical perspectives uh, to uh, teach and write about uh, World War II and 20th century wars as I was about the uh, ancient wars. Uh, I ran courses, for example, option courses at King's, nothing to do with wargaming at first, on ancient warfare, on World War II, and on uh, air power uh, in the 20th century, you see? So mm -hmm. naturally, my gaming went into all of those areas. Uh, 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 some of the games uh, uh, that, that uh, you see here, Second World War, for example, that was right. designed as a simple 90-minute uh, 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 representation of the European theatre of World War II for use in my class. It's never been published. Um, uh, it's available uh, on the uh, Simulating War I.O. group for, uh, freely, um, and various people have used it uh, uh, around the world, but it was originally designed and used for many years successfully uh, in one class of my World War II course. Um, uh, the same with some of my uh, uh, air games. So Angels 1-5, which is in my, my Simulating War book, was designed initially uh, in order to uh, give my students some feel for bombers, escorts, interceptors, the, ta the tactics that were used, uh, the uh, 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 interchange of energy, uh, altitude and, uh, and speed and so on. Just very basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then right. that blossomed yeah, into, as you can see here, uh, a number of uh, other more detailed games uh, like Fighter Duel and Dogfight and now Jet Duel. Um, uh, and the, 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 uh, the point there is that like most hobby games of uh, air power, 
they don't just look at generic fighters. Um, they'll look at particular models of fighters, particular types and so on, uh, and uh, have distinctive performance. But rather than trying to do all that from scratch, I piggyback on published games which already have that data set. So I use the data set from Wing Leader, the data set from uh, Flight Leader recently in Jet Duel, um, to underpin my games. They become total conversions which require mm -hmm. players to own those parent games okay. in order yeah. to be able to play. That's very interesting. Okay. All right. I need to check those out too. Um... By the way, um, uh, you're showing the, uh, the the board game geek uh, uh, listing, which is which is incomplete uh, necessarily. I've never really learned how how to actually add add new games on board game geek. <laughs> well, so I'm, 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 I'm reliant on somebody else doing it. But yeah, there there you're showing my website. My website is the most up to date reference source with links and so on and pictures of all my designs. And rather than giving a URL, I just say, look, Google Sabin War Games. It's a yeah. Google site. You'll find it immediately, uh, and and, uh, th th and they're all there. Yeah. You also mentioned a group IO, a groups IO board as well. That, that that, that's down? right. Yes, we 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 started Yahoo groups for both my yeah. Lost Battles and Simulating War books, um, and they're both still going strong. And this is like fifteen years later, um, but not as a Yahoo group because Yahoo has moved out of that business. Yeah. We, um, so we they're, the they're, 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 <laughs> so that they're now IO groups. Um, right. But uh, other than that, they're, uh, they're they're still going strong. Particularly simulating war, we've had hundreds of posts in the last uh, couple of months. So you've had you have one for each one. Interesting. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna have, mm -hmm. to, I'm gonna have to join both of those. So. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody join those, and so we can start talking about both books. Both books are very good, by the way. Extremely good. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I have to play. <laughs> Every time I talk to a war game designer, I'm like, wow, I gotta play that. I have to play. That. Um, and, and the problem is, of course, um, there are more games being published now almost than there are surviving uh, hobby war gamers. Um, so we're, <laughs> well, we're, yeah. we are get, we're, we're, we're getting to a position where the hobby is designing games which one hopes someone else will notice, but they rarely do. Um, <laughs> my, my, my philosophy is, look, I'm designing these principally for myself, which is one reason I include uh, solo rules whenever I can. Um, yeah, if perfect. anybody else wants to play them, that's fine. Um, but I'm the main audience <laughs> for the design. You do realize uh, and, that's and, why I do these. That's why I do these interviews too, because so I can mm -hmm. so I can talk to people I want to talk to. And if somebody else wants to watch what I say, but I love sure. doing these. I love doing these because I, you know, because we're we're actually few and far between, right? It's just nice to talk to a war, a fellow war gamer. Um, yeah. No, it's it's frightening when you look at uh, how low the print runs are uh, for yes. games now. Um, yeah. And of course, how, how few of the ones that are printed are played. That's always been the case. You know, people have long collected games, hundreds, thousands of games. They've played, you know, a few of them. Um, and that well, continues right. and, to be and, the and, case. And, and there's been this, there's been a, you know, real, a rising debate over virtual versus, I mean, there's been a debate over kind of like the rise of virtual or there's a, a significant rise in virtual uh, war gaming, miniatures war sure. gaming, that all. and I, I, I've been taking part in that. I love it because I, just like you were talking about with just so with manual solo war gaming, with uh, again AI based, but also also non AI based with tabletop simulator mm -hmm. and, and roll twenty. Yep. And even yep. and even Google presentations. I've been doing a lot of war gaming and even cooperative. You can even sure. use. Yeah. You can even use computerized war games and do cooperative uh, and do MDMP, IPD planning. You could do you, you can do planning based war gaming with other people, creek spieling and anything. Right? It's wonderful. Yeah. Now the, um, the, 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 the Internet has transformed the fortunes of uh, manual war gaming. Uh, right. A, a, a because a because you can publicize things. I mean, you know, the, the website you know, is there, and people right. can now download all of this. Uh, previously, you would have had to actually print it and and uh, get someone to pay the postage. Do you see? Uh, so so uh, I don't want to. That? I don't want to destroy the war game, the board gaming industry. But what I want to do is supplement it. What I don't think, what I don't believe that companies have taken on or taken a hold of is that hybrid offering, right? Yeah, you know, we do have like War Game Vault where you can, of course, buy, print, and play. But what what I'd love to start seeing, and maybe people might not want to hear this, 
is, you know, with the insurgence, uh, the rise of uh, Vassal and, and Tabletop Simulator, what I would like to start doing is being be able to pay the public. I would like to be able to pay for a Vassal and have it include the PDF. But, but an encrypted, you know, like an encrypted version of Vassal where we can, you know, give you know, give much more probably than the than the board game margin. I think that's what board game companies don't realize is, or I, I don't know, they don't want to lose their industry, of course. Absolutely, totally understand that. But like war gamers, like we are now international. We are now kind of remote, remote, more so remote, especially with COVID. We, I, that's how I got into virtual miniatures wargaming was because i couldn't sure. i couldn't go and do a face-to-face -face war game anymore so i sure. learned how to do it you know with with roll 20 and tabletop simulator and all these things but what yeah. what i found with repeated play and repeated solo play like you had mentioned before with, with repeated play a rule set will get played it will mm -hmm. get put on the table games mm -hmm. do do nothing on a, on a shelf sure. <laughs> and and of course, now my wife has told me I have to get rid of twice the width of a game in, in shelf space before I buy another game. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. Yes, yes. I, I I had I had to ship all of my games to uh, to to Chile, Chile. Um, uh, and my books, uh, yeah. and and this is uh, you know half a container full. So. so uh, Chop, the chop airplane. Full. The airplane was probably like a good. Uh, no, 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 no. This is not. This is not airplane stuff. This is containers coming on container <laughs> ships. It, it was right. literally a slow <laughs> from the UK, not a slow. Absolutely from the UK. yes. Uh, <laughs> so that yes, the, the the bulk of games is is uh, it, uh, and books, of course, uh, it is a real problem. Um, that being yeah. said, I still far prefer to read a physical book. I sure. still far prefer to play a physical game. I totally. will play many of my games wherever possible with miniatures, uh, and you can see there uh, 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 from my website uh, my six millimeter miniatures used to play Legion Two. Sure, Perfect. you can play yeah. it with the with the counters that are, are provided in the board game. You can play it with the Vassal module that someone's kindly uh, produced. I prefer to play it <laughs> in, in, yeah, in the form does. shown. Everybody yeah. would, right? Sure, uh, but but when you're playing it with someone. Uh, 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 on the other side of the world, the only right. alternative you've got, of course, is, is to use Vassal. So right. for that purpose, many, Vassal is wonderful. In many cases, you have to spend a good half hour to, or even an hour to set up some of the larger, more complex games you're kind of mentioning, all the, uh, some of the more complicated ones that came out of the late 70s and early 80s and so forth. Um, sure. You know, takes hours to set up. You have to get people to show up at a very specific time, which is difficult unto itself. Yep. And you have to get them to repeatedly show up if it's a multiple part match, right? So yep. the fact what I've been even doing lately is I'll even I'll even run Vassal with my face to face games <laughs> and I'll yep. save moves as like yep. a as like a repository of what we of what we did so I could show it later and kind of analyze sure. what people were doing. So there's yep. the, um so that's what I was kind of getting at before is like there is a hybrid it's not to take it over. I actually, I would, I personally would like to see game designers and authors and publishing companies get more money um, from people who prefer hybrid gaming, right? Like, so yeah. I, I think there is more money to be made out there. And I think, and I think when you, when you do start to include that multimedia socialization of it, then it starts to catch on and it might double it, you know, marketing right it, it will sure. if it just stays on the convention floor it's never going to make the, the the six digits that's six right digit it, it's it, it is a difficult balance i mean the, the, yeah. the experience i've yeah. had is with um uh the uh holland spieler games uh, uh horse and musket um yeah. and there they produced um hard copies uh they're very expensive because there's a whole series of them uh, right. i haven't bought any of them uh, I had the opportunity. I've seen them in the shops, but I didn't buy right. them because they were too expensive. Right. Thankfully, they put them on War Game Vault, uh, right. and I, I bought them all. And I've yeah. produced now my tweaked version, which takes advantage of the fact that people can easily get the electronic versions. Do you see? Right. Um, totally. What they're worried about, of course, is that 
people will buy the cheap electronic versions. They won't buy the board game, and therefore you don't have enough of a critical mass to make the board game viable. Um, it's a yeah. very, it's a very difficult commercial decision. It really is. So I, 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 I'm, I'm pleased that I, I got out of the board game publishing business myself uh, on the on the basis of what happened with Lost Big. Battles and uh, right. and the huge amounts of time and, and no profit at all. Um, yeah, and, like, and I now like just put the stuff free. online for free. It's almost like we need to start finding other ways, especially with the prolification of 3D printing. Um, we almost need to start finding different distribution methods for mm -hmm. war games, right? Where where you start to simplify the war games to the point where you know the STLs, the 3D files for printing the game, are a little bit more just streamlined, so that then you can then find distributors in the U.S., find distributors in the U.K. Because what's killing everybody now is the damn shipping, right? Yep. <laughs> right. So yep. I've been hearing horror stories about that, where the shipping is as much if not more than the cost of the game i'm like i don't know how anybody in like australia gets by i, I just don't um, no, my, my experience with lost battles was exactly that even though the game was quite costly um the the normal price to ship it even to uh, from this from britain to america let alone to australia exceeded right. the, the 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 cost price of the game the only way i was able to ship the, is, is by having a special deal with the post office for, for for bulk and and reducing the sh the shipping rates. So I, I I learned firsthand all about that. Anyone tries to just ship, say, a used copy, um, it's going to cost you more in shipping than it is in uh, in in the price of the game, and that's a huge problem. I think, you know, as we were talking about, you know, physical versus virtual. I mean, there are ways to kind of waylay that. Like if you if you especially Kickstarter is helping things too. I think where if if you. But just like the movie industry, really, ultimately, right? Where sure. if you can, if you keep, if you keep the hard copy, the first and foremost, for a good six months, year, I, mean, it, I don't know, just like a movie, you know, it, that time is going to go, that time is slowly, will slowly creep in. But I think, I think there's ways to, to, for companies to continue to make board games physically there's there's a balance there's, there's a happy medium yep. and 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 there is a big market uh yeah. i say big re, re, relative there are a lot of um the remaining uh, gamers who want the physical copy Absolutely. and they want to use the physical copy okay um just putting something online even if it's free most people will ignore it um right. because they they take a physical copy as being an index of quality and something sure. that they don't they don't need to be printing out and whatever uh, they right. can actually just break out the counters and play it right. um so uh, thankfully perhaps there is still this premium on physically produced board games with beautiful artwork and so on the downside of that as as you say it's it, internationally it's difficult to get hold of these things except at ridiculous costs because of customs and and, and shipping but also as has happened with my lost battles game they go out of print almost immediately right and you you literally can't get hold of them right um right. and, and, and they so double, triple on cost <laughs> and then if you try to get yeah. like an ebay copy it's like it's like a, yeah. a, a lost record you know if it's like a, exactly yeah. yeah i mean uh spi now um is out of business um avalon hill is out of business um as a result of that enterprising uh, individuals uh have um, put digital copies of their games for a nominal price or indeed free online. You can right. now access for maybe fifty dollars um, the entire the entire corpus of SPI and Avalon Hill. Oh. Now yeah, this is this is unbelievable. Right. <laughs> um, but you know you want to know what was happening in in, in board gaming in the in the sixties and seventies. For a hundred dollars, right. you can have it all on your computer. Yeah. I need to look into that. All right. um, okay. Uh, uh, so, so in terms of old games, uh, the, the the problem is is less. But for new games where the copyright is is more of an issue, uh, the c companies are still uh, wanting to uh, to recoup their investment. This this problem of out of print becomes a tremendous uh, so issue. I, I'm glad you mentioned new games. That just triggered a, a thought. Um, what I'm starting to see now in war gaming is borrowing rules and approaches from euro games and i think that that is actually starting to make 
war games a little bit more appealing to the mainstream. Uh, one example is Latoral Camp uh, Commander, uh, which is a great game, and, and it bar you know just kind of more card mechanisms. More, I mean, you still have to, like if you look at like Memoir Forty Four or just some of the more just kind of simple sure. mechanic. Um, so I feel like I feel like there's still there is still a market for that gateway wargaming area, and, and um, you know, game again, games like Take That Hill. And I, I think that with just a, some simple, some simple modifications or additions, that it could be made into like the the, the equivalent of like a Memoir Forty Four, which is extremely popular game, by the way. Sure. Um, yeah. I would have to probably imagine that's probably what that's probably the highest yield, maybe physical war game out there right now, other than maybe Access mm -hmm. Now. And Access Now. Right. Yeah, quite. Yes. Uh, no. These these, these yeah. hybrid products with um uh, with with plastic playing pieces and cards yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, very much building on the success of the uh, or, or wooden playing pieces, very right. much building on the success of the Euro yeah. game model. Yeah, um, you're starting to see the fog of war with the the cube, the um, uh, yeah, the cubes. That's not the right word. Um, yeah, blocks. Blocks. Thank you. <laughs> cubes yeah. of a blocky fish. Mm -hmm. Block. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm loving that. Like uh, yeah. we are coming Nineveh. Great game. Uh, yeah. Urban Operations out of Nuts, Pub Nuts Publishing, France. By the way, I yeah. love that publishing company. Sorry, to, sorry, mm -hmm. to not talk about other ones. Um, but there are there is innovate. I, I believe there is still a lot of room for physical innovation and mechanic in innovation in war gaming. And I don't think we're we're not there yet. You know, you know, it's it's. I don't think we've seen the full melding of mainstream Euro and war gaming. I think there's, sure. there's still room to grow and um, yeah. hybrid. And, and, and what I what I will often tend to do uh, is to to get these games that's like the ones you've mentioned uh, with their wooden blocks and their plastic playing pieces. Um, love the 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 the, the components. Uh, dislike the rules for various reasons because everyone your own. has their own ideas. So you make your own. Yes. Um, and, uh, with, uh, my, uh, my approach now is very much is to use the components from published games with my own rules. Well, that's uh, what we used to do with all the. Oh, we used to do that always with all the uh, the Raw Part, the the Raw Part, the miniatures from D and D. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I was always the kid in the neighborhood that reverse engineered D and D back into uh, chainmail. You know, you know what I mean? Yep. Like my own chainmail. Because <laughs> yep. yeah, so. All of the war gamers in your neighborhood, you would find, you would see who that person was because they were trying to make, they were trying to take all the, all the wizards and everybody and sticking them back together into an army. So, so right. Yep. So, on that note, <laughs> so um, uh, we've been talking for a while. Sorry, I think I've kept you more. I said it longer than I said I would. Um, it's been wonderful talking to you. I, uh, uh, I, I'd love another chance to talk at some point, um, maybe a little bit more specifically around lost battles. I kind of, I didn't. I, I kept this more around simulating war. But if you're if you're willing to talk again at some point, I'd love sure. to talk about uh, just very more specifically around you know Alexander the Great and, and uh, some yep. of those battles. I that I, I distinctly remember in my sixth grade getting a book on Alexander the Great. You know that was it. I I went I went towards history after that. I just I became absolutely enamored with all things military history and and. And there's something to say about that youthful connection to history, right? That then becomes a lifelong love of wargaming. It's so, absolutely yeah. this inspiration, the being bitten yeah. by the bug. Uh, uh, you find, for example, I mentioned Charles Esdale's um, Wargaming Waterloo. Uh, he says in that, uh, you know, I was inspired initially. Uh, he's the same age as me, uh, almost, um, by the film Waterloo. Remember that the Bond Oh yeah, film? absolutely. Oh, one um, of my favorites. Yeah, exactly. Yes, uh, Peter Connolly's uh, picture books of uh, of ancient armies. You know, yeah. These are the kind of things that inspire people who then go on to become war game designers, scholars, or, and so on, or writers, or filmmakers, exactly. or, or yep. artists. Yeah, I mean, there's yep. so many. Yeah, absolutely, totally. All right. Yep. Um, yeah. On that note, I absolutely I will keep in touch, uh, Phil, and uh, I greatly greatly appreciate you talking with okay. me. Okay. This 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 jog uh, jog down memory lane and mm -hmm. and recent publications and um, sure. so when we okay. talk, uh, when we talk again we'll talk about what's next what's coming that's next. fine All right. so keep okay. people wanting keep keep people wanting all right yeah. you take care thanks Peter take care.
Take care.